nothing left for me to hate so I can lay me down my brothers on the ground I bled today until coyote comes to raise me up and carries me Hello, welcome to the Scottish Rugby Podcast brought to you by the Scottish Rugby Blog. Uh, I'm Johnny McGinty. We have finally reached the bridge week of the Six Nations. Two tournaments finishing this weekend, one set to start, kicking off on Saturday afternoon. So to join me to have a chat over those and all the soul search that comes with it, we've got Craig Manson. Hello, Craig. Evening. How are we doing? Very good, thank you. We've got Rory Baldwin. Good evening, all. Just checking you were definitely there, Rory. And uh, last but definitely not least, Ian Hay. Who's on mute? Hello, Ian. <laughs> Ian, I'll come Hello. back to you. <laughs> Wait, it's just all for dramatic. Hey. Um, no, I thought it was my headset <laughs> first. It's the Undertaker. But no, I, I spilt my... I had to do a quick T-shirt change because I spilt a beverage. On my uh, on what I was wearing previously, so you know, it's all part of the Eras tour. It's uh, what we're doing here. All these costume changes. The the post can off to a flyer and start this evening. <laughs> Aye. So we have we're live tonight on Facebook, on Twitch, on YouTube, on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. We've got the under twenty six stages to look over. We've got the men's Six Nations to look over. We've got the women's Six Nations to look forward to. We'll get through all of that in the next 40 minutes or so. And then if you fancy hanging about, we are also on patreon.com slash Scottish Rugby Podcast. Join us over there for just the price of a pint a month and you'll get an extra 40 minutes or so of content, of content while we chat over some of the other things that are going on and maybe try and set the world to rights a little bit. We'll start off with... <laughs> Depends who you drink your pints in. Yeah. Oh, that and just for the Warrior sweet. Nation, I'm jacked up on Diet Coke today, so it's just caffeine, not juice. So uh, the Warrior <laughs> Nation are safe today. Yeah, we'll see about that. We'll start very quickly with the domestic league restructuring. We are going next season to a 12 team premiership with Melrose and Watsonians, obviously, with the demise of Super Six. Joining back into the Prem, Borough Muir and Stirling County back up to Nat 1. We're going to kind of feel that out for a year and then it goes back to a 10-team Prem with three teams getting relegated and one promoted, Ian. How do we reckon that's going to play out? I don't know, man. I think like there's going to be a structure and balance. Um, I mean, it depends where some of these Super 6 players end up, but you look at Air, Air had already got promoted to Premiership. So where are the Bulls guys gonna go? You know, if if Air are already premiership ready, as they've proven because they were smashing everybody in that one. But then you add in like Blair McPherson and stuff like that, it's gonna be a bloodbath. Um I also think like just doing it for one season seems a wee bit I think it should be over two or three. Uh it seems like it's not giving people time to adjust properly. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not. That's yeah, it's, I'll stand by that. It's certainly, it's it, well, it's certainly one of the, I'd say, concerns I think that were raised is that this has all happened pretty quickly, Rory. Obviously, with with Super Six just being announced a few weeks ago, that that was going to be continuing, and then they kind of flew through the the league restructure as quickly as they could, and I think there are a few people that think that maybe with a little bit more time, there might have been some better options. Yeah, I think that's probably. I mean, I'm not too familiar with the you know the various options, um, Ian Germain for the for the club game really, but um, I think the the lack of uh, the lack of time has, has certainly played into it, and it just feels. I mean, Super Six kind of felt a little bit rushed with some of the decisions they made over that, but it feels like you know they're well aware that they need a they need a pathway now. Um, if they get rid of Super Six, they have to have something that they can point to and say this is how young players turn into pro players and so they've they've basically you know they've thro- thrown that together um to provide that but whether it's going to be regular enough whether there's going to be players flitting about between different teams um you know different levels just to get game time um not even necessarily if they're being given game time but if they want you know if they want game time you know going and playing for some something else whether they'll be able to do that um, because you wonder if they're just training all the time and then they get an A game every, you know, one, even once a month or something. It's not, it's not really enough, is it? Yeah, and that's obviously the other thing, Craig, that goes along with the leagues being restructured is that we have rejuvenated a little bit the inter district championship and bringing in Glasgow and Edinburgh A teams. We're obviously going to come on to the under twenty six nations in a minute, but do we think that with a lack of Super Six that that's sufficient for the players that we need to develop? Um, well, I'm just going to stand back like Russell Crowe and say to all of the uh, people who wanted rid of all the Super Six and wanted to go back to the uh, to the regional game, etc., and just say, are you not entertained? Please carry on. Um, they, they have asked for this. Everyone has been bumping their gums about it all. So let's just see how it all works out in the mix. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's quite nice to see um, the regional, the, the regions playing each other, and and there's been a certainly um, there's a lot more players within uh, clubland getting some opportunities to play against higher level um, higher level players. But you know, you walk in with a you know, well, it's going to do one of two things. You're going to have the A the A teams from Glasgow and Edinburgh coming in and smashing folk around, or they're going to turn around and go uh, or or these teams are going to then smash them and we're going to be like, well, what's going to happen now with our with our, our pro clubs and, and, and our pathways? So really, you know, it's very difficult to see, you know, to decide what or, or to, to to see what's going to happen because it is so up in the air um, that um, it's just going to all have to come out in the wash. But um, for those who um, were desperate to have this back, well, you got it now. You're going to have to just sit back and watch and see what happens. See, th- this thought has literally just occurred to me, and I'm usually am against this kind of idea, this whole conference NFL structure. But seeing as we now have a, you know, there's there's a logjam of teams that might be competitive within sort of you know 26, uh, with all these players now stepping down. Should we maybe have a sort of two conference Premiership? Eight teams each make it a sixteen team. Because you know things like, um, I mean, one of the reasons that the Ayrshire Bulls were so strong was because uh, you know if anyone who was any good at GHA or Glasgow Hawks, you know, they played well for a season, and then it was like, all right, off to the Bulls you go. So it never gave them any continuity, and it ended up with GHA getting relegated. Um, you know, we know that Hawks have been a, a good supplier of Scotland internationals, and they were feeling the pinch as well. Um, so. Perhaps expanding it even greater than just to to the twelve Premier teams, um, make it bigger because Sterling and uh, is it Sterling and Boroughmuir that are going into, into the, that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean they're I mean, they're going to be strong. You know they they'll have the Super Six um, training, even the ones that come down. You know they've got that extra training experience and skills. They're they're going to be good enough um so yeah i, I say make it a 
Right, right two conferences, eight teams. There we go. And there we go. Player, a bigger right, well, we'll have to. Job. Well, the season ends very early at the moment. The seasons have practically ended. We do play. Uh, the season doesn't end there. The season enough. doesn't end early enough. Don't even get me started. I'm sick of it already. <laughs> We'll have to, I think we'll have to wait and see what happens with the club game. I think there's obviously a lot of options to come out. What were you saying there, Craig? Nobody's asking the real questions. What, who's thought of the, the mascots in this game? You know, the Burnmuir Bear, the, the Stumbling Wolf. What's happened to them, you know? Well, when's the best and is it even the original mascots? Yeah, they're, and, um, they're, they're, all sorry, a, they're all in a back bar somewhere with the original Flinty. Yeah, <laughs> Cammy battering the door down, going, "No, let me in." It's pro- actually, it's probably the basement of a pizza restaurant or something, isn't it? Yeah, it's a public conspiracy. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think away oh, from yeah. the away from what may or may not happen with the domestics, the the only other real news we've got to cover this week, and Craig, this is one for you because I know as much as you love talking about Glasgow, you do genuinely love talking about props. Uh, worst kept secret of the last couple of months, Rory Sutherland signed back on to Glasgow for a two year, I think. They were quite open about it. Contract starting from 24 25. That's got to be good business for Glasgow. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and Suz, I think, you know, as, as he proved on the weekend, um, you know, he's still um, a, a very, very good scrummager. He's, he's a very, very good. And high class player. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, after after um, uh, Worcester, um, a lot of a lot, he, a lot of um, teams didn't know what to do with him, and I don't know why because he's a, he's absolutely uh, an absolutely fantastic loose head, and he works incredibly well for any Scottish team. He, he was a great a great servant for Edinburgh, and I'm sure um, I'm sure uh, Glasgow. I would hope Glasgow fans will get behind him and and, and and welcome him because he will he will do a great job for you. Rory he went on uh, on what now seems to be a cursed Lions tour in twenty twenty one, and it's been yep. a bit of a as Craig says a bit of a drop off for him since then. But I think if if we can get the twenty twenty one Suns back, that's a it's a serious bit of bolster for the Glasgow front row, and it's not a front row that's got a huge amount of real quality depth at the moment no i mean yeah he's what how old is he 30 so he's still got he's still got four or five years potentially uh at his peak i mean he's I probably for it hmm? i think he's just turned 32 wikipedia must be wrong then or the, well, well, that's what we're used to employing older players anyway um it's just it's just luck that Roy Sutherland's from actually Scottish and from Scotland and likes to play for Scotland. Yeah, and interestingly, oh, no, Wikipedia right, yeah, has him born in 1992, and the Google Knowledge Box has him born in 1994. So some, which it will have been crawled off the internet somewhere. So somewhere in the internet has his birthday wrong. Um, and also, Craig, Craig pre, uh, peak age for props. Yeah, yeah, it's a peak age for props. That's yeah. what we, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I think. Yeah, great, great bit of business potentially. He gets to work with Al Dickinson, who's been working with the, the Glasgow front rows and stuff. And he's uh, another one that that did the, did the rounds of the pro teams and and then settled it settled at Glasgow. Um, yeah, I think if you can get if you can get him fit and keep him fit, then he's a valuable addition to the team. Um, he could potent, you know, he could potentially be in line for more Scotland caps. That's not that's not out of the question at all. Um, I guess the issue for Glasgow is who are they getting rid of? Because they're definitely going to get rid of one or two, right? Um, that is is uh, the real Slim Shady going to convert over to tight head and become a backup tight head to Xander, or is he going? Is he going to go and make some money in Japan or France D two or something? Yeah, or I think Glasgow are quite open enough, with... Allendale. Ian, about the fact that that there are going to have to be players going for the door this year. They are talking about. Well, Duncan Weir certainly is talking about extended at Glasgow. Rory Sutherland's come, but in they have said, you know, people have got to to move to make way for this, and I think they're going to want to be very careful with who they get rid of because they have got a great squad at the moment, and and it's certainly a very settled squad that seems to get on really well. Um, yeah, but some of them are sort of, um, well, for example, good old Slim Shady 
probably quite a big error, but not getting a look in the Scotland squad at the moment, is he? So I think he might be one that's for the shop. Um, you know, uh, 10 has been a, been an issue. Um, I think that Tom Jordan, I mean, Tom Jordan's a 12, really. He's kind of been filling in at 10. Um, very successfully, might I add. But then we've got uh, Huey Pilotto, Staff, Staffy and Tom Jordan. So that's, a, that's an incredible uh, combination of centres we can use there. Uh, but who would move on? Well, Kebble otherwise. Alan Dell, I think, was the name that they were mentioned as. as oh, he's not have a contract. contract yeah, yeah. Or he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't have a new. So I uh, think Batty, Batty would stay. I would imagine. Um, you where's John so. Anderson when you need him? But then, is, is, he, is he injured? Or is he just are, we, out are we particularly overloaded? In? I think it's just props. You need to be right. It's crackled. Though. I think that's the thing Wait, is that, that Glasgow us. there's decent depth in some places, Beth, but there's not, a, there's not a lot. So it's, uh, it's interesting. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll see who's coming, who's going as the, the weeks move on. Let's go from people who may or may not be 30 to the opposite end of the age profile. Ian, under 26 nations, just finished this weekend. Uh, disappointing is the word that most people would use about the Scotland campaign. I've seen concerning, banded about quite a lot. It was uh, not a banner Six Nations for the under-20s. Uh, no, um, oh, by the way, all of you disappeared for a couple of seconds. So uh, I'm, I'm, you, I came back in just as you asked. Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's been a disaster for the last four years, probably. Uh Yes, it is concerning. We know that, well, you know, Super 6, for example, you know, all the pathways are shutting down, the 7s are shut down, player numbers are down. Uh, that's why we keep having to, you know, go through the lineage. Um, yes, it is concerning, and it's it, we were rubbish. I mean, the, the Italy game, I saw most of the Italy game when we were doing fine for a bit and then just capitulated in the second half and that seems to be a recurring theme uh, among Scotland national teams at the moment just complete can't say it on non-Patreon things because they're sweary words lots and lots of sweary words but capitulation uh, is the PG one I think Ian touched on it there a little bit though Craig Obviously, the under-20s is not the only path into the Scotland team. The Exiles programme continues to be a, a great source of success for Scotland. When we get on to the men's Six Nations, we'll talk about, obviously, the effect of having and then losing Sione to Pelotu, the difference that Andy Christie made when he came in. Do we think that we need to be really concerned about the under-20s when the Exiles programme is still producing diamonds like that almost every Six Nations? Absolutely, we have to be concerned about it because it's it's the lifeblood of this team, and and we're about to get onto it, and we will talk about it. That we need these players to have um, uh, more experience. They need to be harder. They need to be stronger, and they need to be uh, they need to develop a better a better rugby brain. And you know these sort of things need to be. It's it's almost like we're where um, because we've got a lack of a, a lack of obvious pathway at the moment, um, it's like mar it's like marrying and having children within the same family. We're just start it gets slowly but surely it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And if we yeah, yes, we can go out and we can select the odd few players that are um, that 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 have lineage um, or or. Uh, they've been here for four or five years. Um, but the problem you have with that is you get to a point where you've got players who are playing for the team who really, you know, if we win, we lose, they're getting their wage at the end of it. And and I think I think we're losing a little bit of 
heart. I think we're losing a little bit of um, uh, inner strength, and and it and we're also get. I think playing for Scotland is becoming certainly from what I can see from players out there and their reactions to things. It's becoming to a point where they're not where turning up and playing for Scotland is. It's just a job, and 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 they need to have more of a connection with the, with um, with Scotland and, and with the, the what they're doing. So I think I think we need to continue to develop our own players within Scottish rugby, um, along with the odd smattering of, um, of of players coming in from other uh, other countries, etc., with lineage because they add the spice, they add a lot of work, uh, they add the, they add some phenomenal talent to, to our squads, but we need to have this continual um, conveyor belt. Look at what Italy have done. Italy have this phenomenal conveyor belt now started off, and they're now you know, gone in the days, um, and unfortunately he's not here to defend himself, but gone in the days of Italy are just a, 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 a rubbish team and they'll always be a rubbish team. Um, well, they've shown that you know they're no rubbish team that they'll be taken seriously nowadays. So, I think um, yeah, to answer your question, no, um, I, I I love I love as you know I love a um, I love an exile because uh, you know they, they they do bring a certain thing a certain something to the to the Scotland team. But we need to build this backbone of of uh, Scottish rugby, and we are currently not doing so. Yeah, I mean, so I where, think the, where does that come from? Do you think? Um, what a, a backbone! It's difficult. To, it's difficult yeah, to say. I mean, the, the usual, yeah, the usual kind of arguments are: you got to find more hard working class lads from Glasgow, or you've got to find farmers from the borders, or who you know who aren't afraid of a bit of hard work or something. I don't know, but I mean, I don't know if that necessarily holds holds true. Although at the moment there aren't too many of either of those groups in the uh, in the the wider you know the the full Scotland squad, um, I think it's a tricky one. I mean, in terms of the under twenties, I thought they were, they actually this year looked a lot better than they did last year, even though kind of on paper the end results were largely the same. Um, they certainly, I don't, I don't think they were kind of blown away in the physicality as as they often are. Usually, you know, you watch these games, and you're seeing guys who are playing kind of prem prem rugby or French D two rugby or whatever, and they they look so much further along than our our boys. And you know, the Scotland lads do still look a little bit wee, some of them. But um, I think that you know they weren't getting blown away as as quickly as as they have in previous years. But I think the yeah, it, it's still it's kind of similar to the the full team is the depth. Is um, if you don't get that blend right, or you don't have the quality there on the bench to to bring on, then you kind of you drift away in the last twenty minutes when those players come on. Um, as to where you find that, I mean, the thing is, it's kind of experience. I think the current kind of group of Scotland internationals were helped by having a quite a decent under twenties group that won games, so they weren't just like winning their first game when they get to. Um, you know, to the, the full internet or winning their first kind of important game. Um, winning is a is a habit, as we as we've seen. And once you're kind of used to it, you you have more ways of getting out of jail. Our national team are still perfectly capable of putting themselves in jail, and sometimes not trying to escape until it's a bit too late. But um, I think, yeah, it's it's experience. Um, they seem to also not be as afraid to start young players. So if if you're young, even if you you know. And that gives you a good kind of two, three years in the in the under twenty setup, rather than just one year. Oh, he looks good, and then he's off somewhere, and you never hear from him again. Um, I mean, there were some some great talents. Uh, what was the name of the boy? Fred, is it Freddie Douglas? The open mm, side. Yes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for example, you know, there there's what several. Of, um, yeah, he had, he had a great great tournament. Um, your man Robbie Deans, although they seem to use him off the bench quite a lot, he seemed he made a big difference in the in the last game. I thought when he when he, he came on earlier than planned for injury, and he seemed to do pretty well at the scrums. So I think there's yeah, I think there's there's probably some hope. But again, it's the it's the thing. Um, 
Kev used to look into it onto this the site um, about the number of guys from the under twenty setup who've made made it into pro contracts or made it into the test team, and it's only ever you know four or five is if that it's not it's not too many. So as Craig, Craig was talking about, where do we get the rest of a twenty three international test level twenty three from? That's it. Well, on to one tournament finishes, another one kicking off, one that, that I think we probably do have a bit of hope for, Craig. Women's Six Nations starts this Saturday. We're coming off pretty decent success in the WXV2. We're tickets for sale and well for the games. Do we think that, that Scotland women are ready to take another step this year? I think so. Um, I think they're, they're um, looking at the team that's been named it's the first first real time I've I've looked at a team and thought this is a great team, and then you look at the subs bench and you go, "Whew, that's a subs bench as well." So um, you know, I I, I think they've uh, Brian Neeson's put together a um, a fantastic squad, a, a fantastic um, uh, extended training squad as well. Um, lots of young younger players getting opportunities to train with the squad. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully, he is he is um, uh, tweaking and and, and 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 adjusting things just to make sure that they're they're going to show us a little bit more um, of of what they can do. Um, I, I you know, obviously, we're going to miss Fran McGee, um, you know, but I think um, those that have come in after um, have, have got an opportunity, um, and also just just to. You know, they, not to sound dramatic or not, but they, they have to save the nation at this moment in time because rugby, I'm at this point where rugby has just slapped me in the face again and I'm sad and I want to be brought up and made happy again and I'm sure um, the Scotland women's squad will uh, will do that and we'll, we'll have a good Six Nations. Ian, Fran McGee is a, is a big loss, obviously, and, and hoping she'll be back relatively soon, but... Meryl Smith has been storming the PWR. I think she'll be an interesting addition at fullback. And we have obviously got some of the sevens back, Rhoda Lloyd back in and, and Lisa Thompson. So this is probably about as strong a backline as we can see from Scotland, I would think, without Fran. Yeah, I mean, Craig is obviously hoping for uh, for the women's team to get, bring us some joy. But against England, first off, it's maybe not going to start there. Um Oh, oh you boo! You yeah. got Wales oh, first. Come on. You get Wales, Wales first. It's Wales away. Yeah. First, so. Oh, sorry. So. I've, sorry, I've read something. You're thinking about now. last year. Yes, I am. Or, or next um, year, maybe. I don't well, know. England is what our first I really home like game, is the f- ah, that's what it's it is. It's not even. France is our first home game next week. Well, well I'm so do. I seem to think England's at the end. You've just dragged uh, me into this year. I've just, I've just absolutely <laughs> just fallen into that hole. Wait, well, I've just made a embarrassing. Yes, for myself, right? So right, <laughs> edit this bit out after, right? Um, <laughs> no, but it's good. Um, I'll, I mean, Chloe Rowley is obviously top, top draw, and that's why she was one of the earliest Scottish professionals. But it's, I think it's encouraging to see that Meryl Smith can step in because, I mean, Brian Easton said her performances are, are so good that I can't leave her out. And, I, I, you know, it's good. It's nice to see form being rewarded rather than just um, you know, oh, the tried and tested. This is my team. This is what we go with. Uh, and like Craig said, you know, there's there's fire on the bench there with uh, Raleigh, Louise McMillan, um, and Rachel McLaughlin. Um, or sorry, it should be McLaughlin, shouldn't it? Uh, and even with Jade Conkle missing, this is uh, you know, it, it's the core of what has been a good Scotland team for a while. With a little bit of extra space, but and also when F- if Fran McGee gets back, it's it's a very dangerous attacking side. Yeah. And Rory, friend of the pod, Ellis Martin's on the bench at Hooker as well. She seems to be pretty key to a lot of the stuff that's going on on the training pitch and in the team hotels and things. You see a lot of her content popping up on the the Scottish social media channels, and I think. It looks like that's a team that's going from strength to strength in terms of the relationships within the team, the atmosphere in the team room. Do you think that can make a difference for Scotland? 
yeah, I think um, I think it's 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 the it's building building the culture um, is something that they've probably struggled with in the past, just from lack of time together as a as a squad. Obviously, that a lot of this group had the the WXV two last year, um, the the um, Celtic Challenge gives chunks of the the players time together and a lot more of the girls or or ladies are playing down uh in england as well in little sort of pods of uh of uh, exiles dotted about so i think yeah just kind of familiarity and then obviously yeah building a culture i think it's interesting to see the way women's rugby's kind of approached social media and stuff in a in a different way because it's almost um it's it's kind of come come along at the same time so it's um it, it's it's not the uh, it's not the old granddad trying to work his email that that men's rugby can sometimes seem like on the on the social media um apart from obviously the uh edinburgh and glasgow guys who are doing quite a good job i thought i'd give them a big up um <laughs> the uh yeah I think so we need i to, think they, we need to touch on this sorry Rory. We'll touch no, on this really quickly can... before we head into the into the mid Six Nations autopsy, which is Rory sort of alluded to it a bit there. Some uh, some rugby Twitter discourse, one of my favourite kinds, uh, with some people upset at pundits, fans, commentators uh, referring to the women's teams as the girls this year. Um, I think as as someone who who refers to the men's team as the boys when I'm talking about them and the women's team as the girls, I've kind of got my own thoughts on that a little bit. But uh, on the one hand, I think Craig, it's interesting to see that that women's rugby is is enough in the front of the public conscience now that that's a thing that people are worried about. We've seen the Scottish women's team on X on Instagram and things that they refer to themselves as the girls. What do you think? Do you think it's it's a big storm over nothing, or do you think that's it's something that we need to address before we, the tournament kicks off? Uh, it's it's a difficult one um, for me. Um, I'm certainly not gonna. Um, I'm certainly not going to say yes. Well, I'm going to call call them whatever I think I should call them because that's that's the way I've always done it. Um, I would rather hear from them and see how they want to be um, addressed and, and 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 talked about. I always. Uh, I'm not a fan of girls and I'm not a fan of ladies. Um, I'm a fan of the women's game and I'm a fan of um, uh, of, of Scotland women. Um, that's always been my way. I've always, I've always, and I've always found that I've always had the feedback from um, uh, the the team that they like to be talked about that way. However, um, I am one of those coaches who calls everyone guys. Um, so it's 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 one of those situations where I can't sit here and and, and you know uh, be on my high horse about it um, uh, when when I you know it's just a natural thing for me to see and it's not nothing built from the fact that I've only coached men no no I've I spent eight nine years coaching women and and they were they were fine you know they said they were they they that was part of my coaching and they were happy with it however. And this is the big thing I want to say, is that um, maybe we should be asking the, the, the asking them um, because it's certainly not up to pundits. It's certainly not up to lots of um, uh, men to tell us what we should be calling um, the team. Um, it's down to if women say that they don't want to be called girls, or, or there's people out there who don't who there's, there's women out there who feel that calling the, calling them the girls um, is derogatory. Well, we have to listen to that and say, well, we accept we accept that you're not happy with that, um, and we we change it and we move on. Um, and that's my uh, my outlook on it. Indeed, right. I feel like we've put this off for long enough. Scotland finished fourth in the men's Six Nations. Uh, a great game, I thought, to finish off in Dublin on Saturday night. Although I. Did say in the preview pod that I thought third was our sort of minimum expectation this year. Are we disappointed, Ian, in how the the main Six Nations turned out for Scotland? Yes, as we constantly are. Um, it's always a little could have been, should have been this. Um, 
I mean, do you want me to talk about any bit of the Ireland game or just the, the Six Nations as a whole in this point? Um, Tell me how you feel about the whole Six Nations, Ian. Right, so it's... I mean, the, the Ireland game kind of sums it up, to be honest. It's sort of moments of bits where you're like, this is really good play, and then some just silliness. Um, I think it's disappointing. It is a disappointing Six Nations. Um, we should have beaten France at home because France have not been good at all. Uh, the Italy game, we should have won that. We, it's 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 the same old, same old. You know, it's um, it's a constant. This was pretty good, but then not good enough. And if this decision went this way, this decision went that way. We'd be champions, but those decisions didn't go that way. Um, the penalty count thing is a different matter, uh, but again, it is the sort of usual. What well, it's the same old stuff we've had for four years. Classic Thing is, well, we are playing against yeah, Rory, great teams, um, and that's it. And and Rory, we made the point on the the podcast X account on Saturday night that Scotland finishing with a points difference of exactly zero this year um, kind of suggests that they were pretty much what we thought they were, just good enough in some games, not quite good enough in others. Do we think that's that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think points difference zero is um, <clears throat> yeah, it sum, sums it up perfectly. I mean, I, I said last week when we were talking about how well Scotland were going to have to play I said that Scotland are going to have to be as accurate as they were in the kind of the last 10 minutes bar the last minute against Italy in terms of keeping the ball. And what I didn't actually imagine was that they were actually going to, they were going to play like Italy did in those last 10 minutes, just defending like maniacs for basically 80 minutes barring a couple of little slip ups. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, it was hugely frustrating because it shows that that game in particular showed what you can do in terms of giving yourself a chance against anybody if you've got that defensive kind of defensive platform. Um, and we saw slithers of it against, you know, Italy where they looked like they've got the bonus point, but it's just like little things just seem to put them off their game so easily. And then they just, they can't, I mean, even like in the latter period of like Greg, when Greg Laidlaw was the, the skipper, the game management was, was, pretty good and if Scotland their heads never really went down even if you know they went behind a try and you just thought they'll work their way back into this probably um and often they did you know they'd get a penalty or whatever and I think we seem to have lost that it's it's like they've they've obviously got supreme confidence in their ability to score tries but they're it's like that little it's the it's the the bit just before that to get themselves into the position of 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 cutting the opposition open to get themselves into the position where they're winning a penalty and kicking for the territory rather than just kind of for, forcing it too much. See, they're because they obviously know they right, we've got to get down. We get into the opposite 22, we'll score a try. And they're just so desperate to get down there that they end up throwing stupid offloads off the deck to use but one example. There, there were certainly bright spots to look at this tournament, though, Craig. The, the defence against Ireland, I think everyone kind of agrees, was the best we've seen from Scotland in a really long time. What are the uh, what are the other things that we can cling on to, do you think, going forward, coming away from this tournament? Um, is there things to cling on to, Johnny? Um, <laughs> I, I am absolutely raging about it. I am absolutely and utterly raging. This is the second... Six Nations that we have gone in with a fantastic team, all the hopes in the world. Um, oh, 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 we're probably coming to coming lots of Six Nations with lots of hopes, but we've had the team there to win the win the whole thing, and we have underperformed and chipped over ourselves. And um, to cling on to certain things, yes, um, the the defence was very good against a fairly. Um, a fairly, I would say, uh, an Ireland side that weren't firing on all their cylinders. Um, I think a lot of people have got a little bit carried away calling it a heroic defence. 
Um, no, it's just defence. Get over it and get and get back into your line and get on with the job. Um, uh, you know, we should have had that defence for every single game we played in the Six Nations. Um, I think we we you know that's what you build your game on. You win games with defence and you earn the ability to move the ball wide and play with the ball. And unfortunately, um, we put all our efforts into defence and couldn't attack. Um, we then put every all our all of all of our work into attack and can't defend. Um, our penalty count is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and really, um, maybe the, cling, the, the, the thing that I'm clinging on to is that um, maybe we can change the coach and we can have a better Six Nations with the side that we've got. OK, I'm going to put everybody on the spot then because that's obviously been something that, that's come up is where we go with the coaching team, where we go with the with some of the playing staff as well. Um, I'll give you 30 seconds each. I'll start with you, Ian. What what do we do now? What do we change? How can we fix it? So I'm going to start with somebody who's not on mute. Rory, I'll start <laughs> with you. Uh, okay, uh, keep Aaron Walsh, get a proper attack coach, and don't hire Ronan O'Gara. Concise. Craig? Uh, for me, um, it's uh, I. I don't mind keeping the the on field playing staff. I want a coach in that's going to control them correctly and not um, flip and flop to different different things uh, and different types of attacking or defensive strategies. So I would probably um, I, I would definitely change the lead coach and uh, see where we are. There's seven years he's had enough time. It's time to win things. Right, Ian, you're back with us. 30 seconds, what's your, okay, what's your plan to save the team? No more for you. Um, I have supported Gregor Townsend for long enough uh, against the bring back Venors and whatsoever. Um, <laughs> I do think that his course has been run. Um, he has taken this group as far as he can go, as much as in it as he thinks he is by going to see Pep Guardiola and Steve Kerr at the Gold State Warriors, for example. He's run out of ideas. Um, I also don't think he's a good man manager. Um, and although he has done very well for Scotland, I think we've hit the plateau now and he has to go. And someone else could come in and give new ideas. There we go. Almost unanimous, I think. All right. Before what do you before think, Craig, what, where, what do I think? Yeah. I think we have to, I think we have to change the coach. Uh to be honest, I don't know who we change it to. I think that the the playing staff. I didn't see, to be honest, too many massive issues with. I thought Finn Russell, for the most part, did really well as a captain. Really excited to see what happens with Andy Christie going forward. I think he was a find. He's my highlight of the tournament. I think we learned how important Sione Tuopoloto is. I'd be looking Huge towards them awesome. as... Yeah, I'd be looking towards them as sort of what do we do for future on the field, but I agree with the rest of you. I think a bit of a shake-up in who's in charge of that probably wouldn't do any harm. All right, before Craig's rage actually explodes, I don't think he can hold in the PG content anymore, so we will take it it's to Patreon for the next... I know! We'll take it to Patreon for the next half hour or so and let, let Craig vent a little bit more, so if you are one of our Patreons, hang about and we'll, we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Uh, as for everybody else, that will do us for the main pod this week, so it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from Craig, Rory, and Ian. Bye, all. Bye. Ciao. Right,